Thanks, Greg. Uh, this talk kind of follows naturally from Naomi's presentation. Uh, the subtitle here is Explicit Representation of Convection. That means not using a traditional cumulus parameterization. So I want, have a lot of acknowledgments of various folks, and there are even many more folks not on this slide that had a lot to do with this. This does, in fact, involve the whole ARW development. I uh, thought it would be useful to have one slide on the, the acronym slide. So what's the difference between these two, apart from the replacement of an R with an H in the middle? Um, the, the, really, the cornerstone for all, all of I'm talking about is the Advanced Research Wharf, which has now been around believe it or not, for about 10 years. Um, Non-hydrostatic model, uh, and it, its development was originally kind of motivated as a replacement for MM5, also wanted to couple with operations, but convection was kind of a, a key phenomenon that we wanted to, to do in this model, and, and it come up with a model that was very good in numerics. The AH, the Advanced Hurricane Research Wharf, is derived from the ARW and differs not that much from it. But let me explain a little bit about the philosophy here. So we have this research community out here, which includes a lot of people in this room. Since some of that effort develops new hurricane forecast techniques, can, which can be tested in the AHW, you can look at this as the hurricane configuration of the ARW. And the Wharf Data Assimilation Research Testbed figures prominently into this as well for initialization. And anything we do here, if we like it, can feed back into the ARW uh, and eventually become standard that everybody can use. So that's kind of the philosophy here. So if you see ARW and AHW, they really aren't that different. But back in the early, uh, earlier days, now for me, earlier days here is uh, going back seven years, OK? So I'm not going back 40 years, going back seven years. But this is one of the first uh, sort of real-time forecast applications where we decided to go for resolution, a grid spacing of four kilometers and not have any cumulus parameterization. We actually did this during a severe weather uh, field project called BAMX, which was back in the spring of 2003. And we started running this model every day and showing it to forecasters. And they saw structures coming out of this. We saw structures, too, that were really interesting. And in fact, in this case of a, of a bow-shaped convective system, it kind of looks like the observations. And here's a case of just strong but not so well organized convection in the model and the observations are producing a system that was kind of like that. And we saw this pretty much day in, day out. Sometimes the high resolution model would produce just a nonsensical forecast, but a lot of times it had a lot of information about structure. Oh, well, fast forward about four or five months and we enter hurricane season and we just said, well, what happens if we take this model and stick it over the Atlantic Ocean um, without doing anything different? Do we get anything that makes any sense? And along came Hurricane Isabel. And this was one of the forecasts, same configuration of the model, four kilometer grid, and here's the reflectivity field, which shows some pretty realistic structures as compared with uh, trim uh, uh, 85 gigahertz data. And yeah, there are a lot of differences here. And in fact, I think we're at least a category off in intensity. But the point is, we saw some promising aspects. And you can start looking at this and say, my gosh, what's going on out here? We got all this popcorn convection. But the basic line, idea is that some of the asymmetries and structure in the interior of the storm were fairly well captured. Well, that was encouraging, but certainly uh, one case means pretty much nothing. So um, I'll talk about a more systematic test in a minute. But since 2003, a lot of things have happened. Uh, the development of the moving nest, as, as Bob Talia said, that's an absolutely critical aspect of all, all of this, or at least some kind of mesh re uh, resolution refinement that follows the storm. There have been various wharf upgrades, physics, um, bug fixes, of course, and various other things. Improved flux formulations, uh, added a 1D ocean model, uh, which is really more like an ocean parameterization. The 3D model is in progress and will really depend a lot on uh, incorporating a lot of new things into the uh, repository in this March release. And advanced data assimilation. So what I'm going to talk about in most of the rest of the presentation is this is what was done last year, the high resolution hurricane test, where we thought, where, where it was desired to see, well, what exactly do you get when you just go to high horizontal resolution? High being transitioning this uh, 
coarse, resolu coarser resolution with cumulus parameterization somewhere around the grid spacing of 10 kilometers down to something closer to one kilometer grid spacing. What do you get? So we use the same initial and boundary conditions, the same physics parameterizations, except for the cumulus scheme. However, as, as any, any modelers will know, the same physics, physics parameterizations don't necessarily function the same way once you go to high resolution, uh, once you change the resolution. But the uh, settings were all kept the same. The cases were selected by the uh, Hurricane Center forecasters as difficult cases uh, from 2005 and 2007. They're all Atlantic storms. And we think we have a statistically meaningful sample. It's not large by operational standards, but it is large by research standards. So there are 69 forecasts. And here are the storms. The red indicates that they achieved Category 5. But they were actually simulated throughout their life cycle. So they had, even the, the strong storms had weak phases. Um, here's the list of so 69. You can see they're not evenly distributed. So Emily, Ophelia, Wilma uh, have more forecasts than any, any other storm. And, and there were some really tricky aspects to these. Here's our model configuration for this test. Now what's going to happen is everything, the initial conditions are going to be exactly the same. And the, and the domain configuration on the outer domain is the same. And the only difference is whether we include these two nests or not. And these two nests are drawn basically to scale. They follow the storm wherever it goes in the domain. There's already 34 levels. You can read the 1D ocean. I won't really talk about that too much. And the ensemble common filter, this was a collaboration, an ongoing collaboration still, with the University at Albany, Ryan Torn. Uh, 96 members, relatively coarse grid, and we've actually improved that since. Um, and in this case, because the grid was rather coarse, there was a bias in the initial intensity. Now, I have to say something here, because this doesn't involve bogusing at all. There's no bogusing. There's no synthetic observations going in here. In fact, there are no observations at all in the core of the storm. The only thing that's assimilated is the position and the minimum sea level pressure. It is certainly the case that, especially for very intense storms on a 36-kilometer grid, we will not replicate the observed intensity at t equals 0. And that really wasn't the goal. It was more to, s to come up with an uh, initial state that was in dynamical balance with the model so that when we ran it forward, we didn't get large gyrations, which would obscure the signal that we were trying to see about the, the resolution dependence. The drag and enthalpy exchange coefficients I put on here, um, the main thing is that the ratio of CK to CD is about 0.6 at 30 meters per second, and it does ramp slowly up to about 1. And we can argue all day about what happens out here. Um, I really don't know what should happen. This is just what we, what we chose for these particular tests. So let's get on to intensity. Two aspects here, the root mean squared error and the bias. The root mean squared error is going to be shown as a function of forecast lead time with these different symbols that I hope you can distinguish um, the, that are solid filled. So the, just look at the top section uh, group of uh, symbols. The official forecast for these storms is down here. And, and I think this is why they picked these cases as being difficult, because this is much larger than you would typically see at a 72-hour lead time. Um, what you see is the official forecast certainly does better than our, our forecasts uh, for the first uh, 36 hours in a statistically meaningful way. And when I say statistically meaningful, I did a, a bootstrap a resampling test to, to compute that. The high resolution is in the gray diamonds. And that is, I would say, systematically <coughs> better than the coarse resolution. But the statistical significance is marginal except for 72 and 120 hours. When you look over all forecasts, all lead times, the improvement from the high resolution is about 8% in terms of root mean squared error. And now the bias on the bottom. The, the course resolution 12 kilometer has a negative bias, which we're not too surprised about. 12 kilometers is kind of marginal for resolving the inner core. And the bias is about uh, between 5 and 10 knots. The high resolution has a bias of a few knots in the other, in the other direction. Now, if you remember the earlier talks from today, uh, one thing that definitely could be contributing to this is the fact that the, the dissipation is going to be a lot less in the high resolution. But what's interesting about it is these errors, these small positive biases, are all coming for weak storms, not strong storms. These negative errors for the uh, 
Course resolution are coming for strong storms, not weak storms. So the way errors are manifested is very different in these two systems. So I don't think it's just the dissipation that's going on here. And we can kind of quantify um, whether the high res where the high resolution helps in terms of the spectrum of intensity. So basically what we've done is taken the, the, absolute, the difference in the absolute value of error, which is plotted on the vertical axis, and this is a, a, a joint histogram representation of the, that difference plotted against observed intensity. And you could do this as a scatter plot, and you just get kind of a mess. But this is sort of quantizing it into boxes. And you can see that at low intensity, uh, there really isn't a whole lot of difference in, in this plot. It's pretty much the same. Uh, there's not a lot you can say. At high intensity, you can see there, the negative, meaning there's larger error for the 12-kilometer uh, forecast does start to manifest itself. Again, that's not too surprising. That's kind of what we thought. So it is true that there is benefit for the more intense storms using this high resolution. Rapid intensification. This is, can the model detect a change of uh, 25, an increase of 25 knots in 24 hours or better? And it's set up as a standard 2 by 2 contingency table. So your hit is where you predict a 25 knot change in the correct 24 hour period. Uh, and a miss is obviously when or false alarm is when you don't. And the skill, by that definition, is highest for these high-resolution forecasts, which is interesting. I should point out, of course, the official forecasts are not necessarily trying to predict the rapid intensification explicitly. They have to be somewhat conservative. So this is not necessarily a surprise there. The main point is that you do gain something relative to the course resolution for rapid intensification. The last thing really I'll talk about is the wind verification of wind radii, starting to get in now to the structural aspects of these storms. And what we did is, is a very simple thing. We computed the, the extent, the, radial ex the maximum radial extent of a given threshold of wind, either 64, 50, or 34 knots. And we compared it with what was in the extended best, best track data. Uh, and we binned basically the... Uh, wind radii into roughly 10 equal bins going out uh, in radius. Now, this doesn't imply necessarily that that's the accuracy by which these, these are estimated. It was just a convenient way to quantize the results. So I'm going to show here our, again, this joint histogram representation of predicted radius of, of 34 knot winds in this case. Um, is down here, observed radius of 34 knot winds is here. So you'd like all your points to lie along the 1-1 the one, one diagonal, all your, all your data to fill these boxes. And of course, it doesn't. Um, but what, what was interesting, at least to me, is that it wasn't a total disaster. There was definitely some uh, reasonable clustering of, of the uh, forecasts along this 1-1 one, one line. Now, on the left side is the um, high resolution forecast, and on the right side is the coarse resolution forecast for the 34 knot wind radii. And you can't see a whole lot of difference, but I'm going to get to some statistics in a minute. When you look at the 64 knot wind radius, now we've changed our, our bin width to, to 10 nautical miles. Again, not that that's the inherent uh, accuracy of the estimate, but it was convenient for, for stratifying the data. You see, again, there's uh, more or less data lying along this one one line, and there's a, but there is a fair bit of scatter. And there's especially a lot of over forecast in the 12 kilometer. So the 12 kilometer uh, grid is, is predicting wind radii, the extent of hurricane force winds to be too great. So intensity was biased a little low. The extent of the winds is too large. And we can come up with a, a threat score. Uh, I'll just move on to the next slide here, which estimates the skill in that. And it's, based, it's a lot like a standard uh, equitable threat score. Um, the point I want to make about this is that as a function of lead time, these scores are not that high. Uh, point 0.1 is pretty marginal skill. But the interesting thing is the slow fall off with time for the 34 knot wind radii. And that was a, that's an interesting sort of thing because it suggests that there really is a synoptic time scale governing the error, uh, the, the predictability of, of, the, of the outer wind radii. And I think that's probably somewhat intuitive. But what it sort of means is that maybe we can gain a lot by trying to improve the uh, wind structure of the outer winds at earlier times if the, decay, if the error growth is fairly slow. So some conclusions here. Um, for the resolution comparison, I didn't show it, but not surprising, there was no significant track difference between high and coarse resolution. Uh, 
There's slightly improved intensity for the nested runs, uh, like about 8% overall. It's not uh, dramatic, but it was there. Um, improved skill for rapid intensification and the wind radii for the nests. I didn't really uh, I didn't show that on the last slide. Um, you can talk about it afterwards if you want. Gale radius error is governed by the synoptic scale. All right, well, what are some next steps? Um, certainly, the, the high-resolution data assimilation. We haven't touched the inner core with data assimilation, really. And I think, it, it, obviously, it's going to be an important part of uh, progress in the next few years. The outer domain seems to be a rather uh, important thing, choosing that correctly. We've had some problems, especially with uh, Hurricane Fred this past year. Our domain just wasn't quite big enough to capture it, so that's an issue. Uh, I guess this, and, but I want to say something about, and this was something raised this morning, the predictability of how much we get out of data assimilation in the vortex core. We don't really know how long that improved information will last. So finally, I want to put some, put up here some needed advances for the advanced hurricane wharf, research wharf, and one that, as I already mentioned, the 3D ocean model. Idealized vortex initialization. Now, several people are already doing this. But it's not really part of the community package, and I think that would be a very valuable tool. Moving nest in the ensemble framework, uh, that's something that's uh, it's on our plate to try to do. Um, improve surface atmosphere exchange. Uh, I wouldn't say we're, we're moving rapidly in this direction, but we definitely want to move in this direction. Um, and lastly, I want to emphasize this detailed diagnostic analysis that Naomi was talking about. There's so much data out there, and just getting started at using it to do full three-dimensional comparisons of these storms uh, is an important challenge, but necessary to gain understanding of where these where errors are coming from. That's all. Thank you.